Galatians chapter 1. I'd like to pick up where we left off when we left off around verse number 16. Galatians chapter 1, and let's just read uh, verse 16 here. It says, To reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We do thank you so much for uh, being so good to us. Thank you for such a good week. Uh, Lord, thank you for the, the amount of opportunities there's been to witness. And man, Lord, I, I mean, that's just encouraging to my heart. And God, I pray you'd set before us an open door that no man can shut. But we need you to do that, Lord, because we have little strength. We aren't much, and we really can't do anything for ourselves. And we need you. But Lord, we have your word, and we're held fast by this book, and we don't apologize for believing every word of the King James Bible. We don't apologize to anybody for that. You gave us this book, and so we trust you with it, and we thank you for it. We certainly don't apologize for standing by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and lifting that name above every name. So, Father, tonight I pray that you'd help us as we get into the text. I pray that you'd make this, this message, this study, this verse-by-verse -verse study a blessing to the hearts of your people. I pray you'd give me liberty and direction and leadership. Uh, help me to share my heart and mind with the folks so long as it's in tune with you. And I pray you'd guide me and direct me in everything I say and everything we teach here in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice, if you would, uh, just a little bit of an overlap here. Paul's talking about his conversion and uh, what, what had, had gone into his life. Look back at verse number 11. He said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Watch the next verse. For you heard my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. See that? How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father, uh, my father's. So Paul was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, which is important for you to note, who was one of the greatest teachers of that time. Uh, the Apostle Paul is no dumb individual. He had to be an absolutely brilliant man as far as an intelligent quotient is concerned. His IQ must have been very high to be able to sit at the feet of Gamaliel and be taught and protégéed by Gamaliel himself. And Paul was somebody who had made a lot of profit in religion. And obviously, as you know, religions make a lot of money. Uh, that's usually the motive for most religions. Uh, I don't really care too much at all for any kind of a man that I perceive whatsoever as having a motive for the ministry being money. Uh, it just it ir irritates me to no end. It makes me so aggravated. It frustrates me. I literally, uh, forgive me for this, and, 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 I'm, and I'm praying right now because I don't want to overstep between me and the Lord, but I think I'm okay in saying I don't care to slow down long enough to spit on him. When a guy's motive for the ministry is money, I mean, he doesn't recognize that there's souls of, of, of men and women that are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. There's people with problems. There's people with troubles and trials and struggles and difficulties. There's broken hearts and broken minds and broken homes and broken souls and broken bodies everywhere. And if your motive for the ministry is money, like my preacher said, you can't afford to preach. Uh, I think those guys, if they're even saved at all, are going to be in a real bad way at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. I mean, I think about that sometimes, man. I don't ever want my motive to ever be about the money. Now, it's not wrong for a preacher to be well taken care of. I think this church takes very good care of me, especially considering the size of our church. And I'm grateful for that. I mean, I know some guys that won't let the church take care of them, and that's kind of a bad situation. Do you know why that's a bad situation? Here he is pouring his life out for you, right? He's always serving you all the time, answering his phone and there for all the bad moments and all the rest of that stuff, and then he won't let you do anything back to take care of him. So what happens is he winds up being in a position where he's got an advantage over you because he's all give and there's no give back, and that doesn't create a very good relationship between a pastor and his people. You understand that. 
I mean, it's a blessing to me when I'm frustrated. It's a blessing to me when I'm discouraged. It's a blessing to me when there's kind of bumps in the road in the ministry. And no matter what church you're in or what church you pastor, who your pastor is or who your church people are, sooner or later there's bumps in the road in the ministry, okay? That's just how it is. There's no getting around it in a sinful world. Well, to me, it's very encouraging when there's bumps in the roads to walk in and say, I really like my house. And you know what those people do? They pay my paycheck. It's nice to me to put my suit on my back and say, I like my suit. And you know where it come from? It come from God's people taking care of me. That's a blessing. What I'm, not, I'm not talking about it's wrong for a man to be supported in the ministry. I'm talking about a man whose motive is the money. I'm talking about all the shenanigans that go on in church. And boy, there's no end to the shenanigans that go on in church. And just let me say this real quick. Shame on you if you give your money to these television preachers. If you're broke and you're trying to give your money to these manipulative preachers and you don't have the sense to figure out when you're being manipulated, then you ought to be broke. <laughs> don't be funding some kind of a hypocritical liar whose motive is your money. Don't fund that stuff. There is a lot of profit in religion. And Paul said, I profit into the Jews' religion above many mine equals in my own nation. And the reason he profited, look at him, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now listen, not every tradition is a bad tradition. I think one time in the Bible, traditions are mentioned in a positive sense. Not every tradition is wrong. I'll give you one. We, we do an altar call. Can you show me a chapter and verse that says you have to give an opportunity at the end of the service for people to come forward and pray? You know, that's actually kind of a tradition that began, and I don't hold me to it. I think it was uh, the Second Great Awakening or something like that where they actually started doing the altar calls with the sawdust trail and people were walking the, the aisle at the end of the service and getting saved. Nothing in the Bible says you have to do that. I sure like it. I sure have made some decisions at an old-fashioned altar, which just is literally, it's just a sign of old-fashioned church. You don't even have that going on nowadays in the contemporary churches. There is no, there's no drawing the net at the end of the message. There's no responsibility of the hearer to take what was preached to them and do something with it and make a decision at that moment between them and God. Listen, I'm not here to pressure you, but when the Bible is preached and the Bible is taught and, and, and the Holy Spirit of God is moving, then there should be some pressure between you and the Lord at some points in your church service, at some points in your church life. You should experience a little bit of pressure to make a decision for God. Right? Amen. So I like, I kind of like that tradition and I don't plan on stopping it. Amen. Not every tradition is wrong. But when you're exceedingly zealous for traditions that go against the word of God, aren't supported in the word of God, and all you've got is tradition, and you base your doctrine on tradition, you are way out in left field, i.e. Roman Catholicism. Amen. Well, it's the oral traditions passed down from the fathers. But the, but the oral traditions passed down from the fathers... Con contradict and go against the word of God and if it's going against the word of God you've got to throw the traditions out yeah. and Paul was exceedingly zealous of those traditions the other thing that I think is important to notice is in verse number 15 he said but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace that's a weird thing ain't it to say you guys know what Paul was doing when he was exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his fathers, he was persecuting the church. So from birth, from the time that he was born, God had a plan for the Apostle Paul's life. And Paul had been pushing against that and fighting against it. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 1, please. God had a plan for Paul, and to me it's very encouraging to see this. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because if God was going to pick and use anybody, Paul would be the least likely candidate. Really. I mean, according to what we see in the Bible, Paul is not a good speaker at all. The Bible tells us that his bodily presence was weak and his speech contemptible. I don't think Paul was in any way, shape, or form attractive. I, I, I have a vision of him in my own mind, and I can't wait to get to heaven to see how much of this is like real, and like, wow, the Lord really was showing me that, or wow, I was way off, you know what I mean? But I see him as being, and tradition will say that he was probably about four foot 11, under five foot tall. I see him as being kind of hunchback, 
just from being so tore up and all the scar tissue on his back, from all the beatings he'd been through and all the problems that he'd have and all, all the times in prison and all the rest. Of, I see him sort of being hunched back. I see him being real skinny. I mean, I personally would guess, I would guess 115 pounds tops. That's how I see him. I'm not saying I'm right. I also see him, since he had so much eye troubles, his eyes being kind of small and shriveled and sunk in already as though he was a very aged man when he wasn't that old yet. And for whatever reason, I don't know why I see this, but I see him with a big old hawk nose. No idea why. Maybe he'll kind of like my Uncle Joe. I mean, that's how my Uncle Joe looked. Completely unattractive. Nothing impressive about him at all. Like if you weren't in tune with the Spirit of God when he walked in the room, you would never notice him other than, oh, wow, who's that little guy? That's weird. I think if you were in tune with the Spirit of God when he walked in the room, you'd say, who's that? Something about him. But I think if you weren't in tune with the Spirit of God, Paul would never be anybody that would catch your attention at all. The thing about him is that he was brilliant. The thing about him is that he was very successful. The thing about him is that his, his mind, his intelligence, and his status somehow, his zeal somehow, his, his abilities at some point or another in this world had brought him to a point where he was a, a leader. He was somebody that was looked up to. He was somebody that was in charge. He was somebody that was sent out to find those Christians and wreck those Christians and lock them up and bust up their assemblies. Think about crying children and crying wives and all the rest of that stuff while he's hauling them off to prison and persecuting the church of God and wasting it. A very religious man, but according to God, a evil, wicked man, according to God. An evil, wicked man. Who, according to 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says in verse number 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust... Excuse me? When God looked at Paul all the way back from his mother's womb, God said, I got a plan for him. I'm going to commit the gospel to his trust. This is the man destroying the bride of Christ. Listen, I'm sorry, but from a, from a, from a groom's perspective, I would never have good plans for anybody who destroyed, wasted, beat, abused, and misused my wife. I would have no good plans for that person at all whatsoever. I don't think you'd find an ounce of mercy in me, to be honest. I'm talking about Mike Reagan. You understand that, right? Mike Reagan, I don't think, would have an ounce of mercy for somebody who beat my wife. Think about that for a minute, fellas. You walk up and find some guy beating your wife. I mean, ruthlessly beating her. Doesn't care if she dies. Blood everywhere, screaming and crying, and just not stopping. Are you looking at me and telling me you wouldn't put a bullet in between his eyes? But this man was abusing the bride of Jesus Christ. And somehow or another, I'm telling you, God is so great, you can't fathom it. Somehow or another, while that man was abusing his bride, God said, I have plans for him. God was going to commit something to him. Look at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You know what I like about Paul? He had credentials that would blow your mind. Sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Influential, all the rest of that stuff. All these credentials. And what he said is, I thank God that God made me able to do what I'm doing. Because without God enabling me, there's no way I could do what I'm doing. It's not even possible. See, Paul was very different than the modern day Christian. Paul was very different than most of the modern day preachers. You know, he didn't think his degrees hanging on his wall made him somehow capable of doing the work of God. Watch what he says. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. In other words... He injured many. He was a hurtful, destructive, damaging, ruthless, relentless, wicked, selfish, self-centered, godless, depraved man. I hope you're not like that. He said, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul wasn't 
purposefully and, and, and in understanding what he was doing, go out, going out and doing it, Paul was deceived. Now hang on a minute. Have you looked around lately? Talking to a police officer this week, and he was talking about how bad it's getting out there. He actually told me that out this way, like this, this part of, of, of metro Detroit area, the area that's always been nicer, the area that's always been safer, he said a lot, if not most, of the shootings have been happening out here lately. He said the mental health crisis is like going out of control. Out here, where the money is, where it's safe. You know what you got all around you, folks? You got ignorant people in complete unbelief, but to be honest with you, some of them just don't know any better. Just They just don't know any better. God's been working on me so triple over time because I'm telling you, I think I was born at least 100 years. I used to say 50. Forget that. I think I was born 100 years out of my time. I don't think I belong here right now. I, I can't relate. To me, I get aggravated with, 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 with the effeminate nature of everything and everybody everywhere. It just aggravates me. You, you got you to gotta give me a break for a minute, okay? If you don't understand why, you got to give me a break. I grew up with a dad who said, I'm going I'm to raise a Christian man, but I ain't raising no, uh, used a very insulting term. Sure. I ain't raising no sissy. If I was standing there like this, slouched over, or with my stomach out, slouched back, my dad would smack me in the stomach and say, suck your stomach in and stick your chest out. Stand up like a man. Square your shoulders back. Pull them back. He would walk up and just smack me in the gut. Like, uh, uh, pull your stomach in. Stick your chest out. So I walk like that, and everybody thinks I walk like that because I think I'm a tough guy. I was like programmed to walk like that. I can't stop. I hate seeing myself move. I don't like it. But that's what, how I was taught. Get your hands out of your pockets. Stand up like a man. Look me in the eye when you talk to me. Speak up, boy. I'm talking to you. Look me in the eye. That's how I was raised. And, I, and I, I, I think it's kind of neat. I think guys should act like guys. I mean, I believe that. I think it's way okay for you to sit like a man and walk like a man and talk like a man and act like a man. It doesn't mean you have to be a jerk. You can be gentle and kind and gracious, okay? And it doesn't mean you know, you're, comp you're, you're compensating because look at him. He's trying to act like a man. No, it means you're acting like what God made you to be. <laughs> I mean, to me, that just makes sense. And to me, I think a girl should act like a girl. I think it's way okay that you curl your hair and put your makeup on and carry yourself like a lady. I, I like that. I think that's just right. That just makes sense to me. You all look at me like I'm crazy. I don't, I don't really care. I don't really have the time of day for a woman who wants to prove she can beat me up. I'm not interested. I wouldn't fight her anyways. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Like, no, I would just let you beat me up. I'm not going to fight you. You're a girl. See, it's a win-win for me because if she can beat me up, that's the worst thing ever. So I'd rather just let her beat me up and it's like, I just didn't fight back because she's a girl. It's a messed up culture we're living in. And, and you want to know something though, folks? God has mercy on people we don't have mercy on. A lot of them just really, truly don't know. And what they need is, they need some help. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, I think God's seeing some of them right now, and God wants to save some of them right now, and I believe the Holy Spirit of God is working on a lot of them right now, and if some of us Christians will wake up and get over ourselves and get a vision for the lost and a burden for souls, God might enable us to reach some because they're ignorant in unbelief. They just don't know any better. Man, we need some wisdom because they're not easy to reach. Most of them you're not going to reach the first time you talk to them. Well, that was Paul. Verse number 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Ain't that great? Ain't that a great verse? The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Do you ever stop to consider that Jesus Christ loves sinners? I mean, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I realize the wrath of God abideth on them. I get all that. I get that they find the love of God at the cross of Calvary. But he died for them when they didn't care about him. Right. You know, that song we just sang, the second one, was that Blessed Redeemer? Man, what a song. 
seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners pleading. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Man, I want to be like that. I just want to be more like him. Watch this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. He said, what I'm going to tell you is true and it's faithful and you, all of you should accept it that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Watch it. Of whom I am chief. You ever meet some maybe well-intentioned, I don't know, but super spiritual, oftentimes Christians say, oh, I'm the chief of sinners. You just corrected the Bible. Because the inspired word of God said the apostle Paul is the chiefest of sinners. And when Paul said that, the Holy Spirit said, that's right. Write that down. Put that in the book. That came out of eternity past. Those people need to know you're the worst. <laughs> you're the worst, Paul. <laughs> what you did to my bride, you're the worst. And I'm going to take the worst. And I'm going to put my hand on the worst. And I'm going to use the worst to do the best job any Christian's ever done and write 13 books in my Bible and go around establishing churches and preaching the gospel and seeing souls saved and going to prison and everything else. I'm going to use the worst for my honor and for my glory. Now, how about that? When some brainwashed individual who doesn't understand their Bible doctrine comes along and tells you, well, you've been divorced so you can't preach even if God called you. That might be fundamental Baptist doctrine. That's definitely Roman Catholic doctrine. But it ain't Bible doctrine. Not when you study the subject from the Bible. God will use who he wants to use. And that's one thing about the Lord that I love and don't like. You know why I love it? I love it because God uses me even though maybe some of the brethren don't approve. <laughs> I love it. I love the fact that God didn't stop to ask people. Uh, go back to Galatians 1, if you would, please. God didn't stop to ask people whether or not it's okay for him to call me to be a pastor. You know, I had people telling me uh, when I got called to preach, saying, go ahead and go to a mission field or be an evangelist or something, but don't be a pastor. People literally said that. Don't be a pastor. You're not cut out for it. Hey, you know what? They were right. I agree with them. But it's, the problem is that God had different plans. <laughs> You know what I am? No, no doubt about it. You know what I am? I mean, I hope you know what I am. <laughs> I hope you could say amen to it. I'm a pastor. I actually love it. I told my wife today, I said, I can't believe I ever thought that I would be happier being in evangelism. I was crazy. <laughs> I did not know what I was even talking about. God was always right. He's always been right. I'm glad and I love it about God that he doesn't stop to ask people's opinions before he calls somebody to do something or uses somebody. But you know why I don't like it about God? I don't like that part about God. You know why I don't like it personally? In the flesh I'm speaking as a human. You know why I don't like that? Because he uses other people that I don't think he should use. <laughs> God didn't stop to check with you. God doesn't care what you think about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. God does what God wants to do with who God wants to do it with, and that's that. Your personal emotions and your personal feelings and what they did to you or didn't do to you or all that stuff, that has nothing to do with anything. <coughs> that has nothing to do in the economy with the economy of God or the plan of God. It's none of your business and it's none of my business. God will do what he wants with his people, and that's simply that. And I love that about the Lord. Back to Galatians chapter 1, he says in verse number 16, So God separated him from his mother's womb and called him by his grace to do what? To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Now that's a deep verse. You know what God saved you for? You have a purpose after you've been saved. Do you realize that? I don't care if you're a preacher or not. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, that for thy pleasure we are and were created. You were created for the pleasure of God. I don't care if you like your height. I don't care if you like your weight. I don't care if you like your gender. I don't care if you like your eyes or your nose or your looks or your family or your background or your social, socioeconomic status. I don't care if you like your race. I don't care if you like anything. I don't care. 
None of that matters. I don't care if you like whether you're bald or not bald or what. I don't care. God created you for his pleasure. So it's God's business what he does with you. God created you just like you are. And you ought to give what you are to God. I don't care if you're melancholy or if you're outgoing or whatever you... I don't care. I don't like my personality. So what? What does that have to do with anything? God created you for his pleasure. So if God wants you to be like you are, then that is God's business. Quit envying somebody else who has something you don't have and thank God you got whatever you got. You don't deserve what you have anyhow. It doesn't matter what you and I think of ourselves or of our status. None of that matters. You're created for his pleasure and his goal is to reveal Jesus Christ in and through you. And there ain't a person in the room that can't do that. Not one of you can't do that. You see why the preachers, the good preachers, the old preachers, the smart preachers, the preachers that know the Bible and know the God that wrote it and have been around for a little while. You know why they tell you that the most important thing in the world is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and nothing matters more than your personal walk with Christ? Because that really is all that actually matters. I'll be preaching to you a little bit about it on Sunday morning. It's the things of eternity that matter. And you got to realize that God wants to reveal Jesus Christ in and through you. And until you submit to that and begin to follow that process and that plan and seek Jesus Christ in you and his will in you, until you submit to that and get after that, you're never going to be happy. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. One book to your left. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 1. He says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? Ye are, ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You see that? You mean people are reading you? People are reading you. I, I think I mentioned it to you Sunday about an older guy this week who had some, has some money and whatnot. And I, I, he said he leasing some property to some preacher. And that preacher, he'd, he'd, he'd bill him for the right amount. And the preacher would write him a receipt for X. And he'd bill him for Y. And he'd write him a receipt for X to try to help him with his taxes. And he's like, I don't like that stuff. It seemed like he declined the offer, to be honest with you, because he said, I don't like that stuff. I said, well, I just want you to know that just because some other preacher did that doesn't mean this preacher does. I said, I could care less about a little bit of stinking money. I'm more concerned about my testimony in this community than I am cotton-picking money, man. It's ridiculous. It makes me so angry. And he said, yeah, I know. When I said I'm not that way, he said, yeah, I know. I've known you a long time. That scared me. You know why? He's been reading me. He doesn't look like he's watching me, but he's watching me. And I'm telling you right now, when you walk in and say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, what would you do over the weekend? I went to church. You know what people are doing? People are watching you. You know, you're all the Bible some people are ever going to read. That's why the Bible tells, tells saved women when they got a lost husband that she can win them, that they can be one without the word because they won't listen to the Bible. He said they can be one without the word by your godly conversation. The way you live and the way you conduct yourself, the way you behave and the way you walk with God and the way you treat your husband and the spirit you have and the heart you have and the attitude you have, that can, that can work on him and work on him and work on him in a way you don't even know it's working because he's too proud, arrogant, stubborn, self-righteous egotistical, foolish, and blockheaded to show you because he's lost and needs to get saved. <clears throat> or he's saved and backslidden and you have no idea how you're wearing away at him when you walk around singing Holy Bible, book divine Precious treasure thou art mine Mine to tell me whence I came Mine to teach me what I am he was listening to in the car on the, all the way home. And he walks in and there's a different spirit. 
and it's, it's aggravating them. Because what is that? It, it's Christ in you. There's something inside of you. Realize how powerful. Do you understand how powerful, how powerful, how powerful Christ in you is? You think about that for a minute. And then you don't bother to walk with him. You don't bother to talk to him. You don't bother to read his love letter to you. Holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure, thou art mine. You don't bother, that's a precious treasure. I've never seen somebody sing a song to a Bible because you ain't seen anybody that knows God that close. I'll show you Sunday. You can't separate him from his word. You can't. That's all I have in this world that I can hold on to that shows me the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, what to believe, how to behave, how to follow him. Right? This thing is precious. So you're a living epistle. Verse 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. That's Christ in you. See, it's, more, it's about more than just being a Bible believer. And I am. I don't apologize for it. I'm a Bible believer from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And when I tell you I believe the Bible, I mean I believe every single word of the King James Bible is inherent, infallible, inspired, preserved, on and on and on. You believe in dual inspiration? Just, just leave me alone. <laughs> just, just leave me alone. I don't, I don't even just... I'm not saying that to you. If you don't understand that issue. I'm saying it to people that don't believe the Bible's inspired and push back on it. Do you understand that when I say just leave me alone? You ask me if you've got questions, please. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying in context. When people doubt it and think you're stupid for believing it and make those kind of accusations, my response is leave me alone. Why? Because I just, there, there's no doubt about this book is absolutely the perfect word of God. And if you're educated and you study the facts and you pray and you got a heart to know the truth and you got a brain and all this education, God's going to show you how perfect that book is. Amen. So when somebody's got an education, done all kinds of research and claims that they've been praying and looking for the truth and don't believe the Bible still, something their eyes are blinded. That book is perfect. But you see, it's not enough for me just to say I believe the Bible. If I really believe the Bible like that, then shouldn't I be living it? Shouldn't it come out of every pore of my body? Shouldn't it change who I am? Shouldn't Christ be revealed in me? Shouldn't people be able to see with time that Mike Reagan ain't the same guy Mike Reagan used to be? I hope and pray that you, you would say, Pastor, you've changed. I've had people leaving the church, you know, kind of backslidden and frustrated with me and say, well, you've changed. And depending on the context, who's saying it and why they're saying it and the spirit in which they're saying it, my response has been once or twice, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I should be changing to be more like Christ. See, people all the time use this excuse, well, that's just my personality. Well, you just don't understand the way I was raised. Well, that's just how I am. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> that is how you are. And how you are is a problem. And you're hurting people. And you're driving away people you love. And you're not letting Christ be revealed in you. God wants to reveal his son in you. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 27. Colossians 1, 27. The Bible says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. So God's going to make known the riches of the glory of a mystery. What is the glory of this mystery? It's Christ in you. The hope of glory. Yeah, see how powerful that wording is? We take it for granted. We take it for granted. See, I have a distinct privilege of being supported full-time to be able to read my Bible and pray and study and all the rest of that stuff, and it's a real privilege. And you could sit there and get out a hymn book and be studying and praying and open a hymn book and sing some songs and just try to get, you can kind of get lost in it, you know. And then you get done and you walk out of the office and you get in the car and walk in the store and you're just like back into the real world where everybody lives. 
You know how drastic the difference is? <laughs> You know what happens to you poor folks going to work every day of your life and getting around all these lost people? Without realizing it, you start walking in the flesh again and you forget all about what's in you. So you'll be at men's warehouse and instead of seeing a guy there to talk to who's actually looking for some help in the truth, you just kind of like are in a hurry to get through your deal and get what you need and get out the door and get on with your day. You got a treasure inside of you. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ if you're born again. And you ought to be tuned into that. That's important. All right, back to Galatians chapter 1. So he said, God wants to reveal his son in me, right? And so he says in verse 16, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Um, now let me just say this, and um, I'll touch on it and we'll get done here. We'll keep moving. A lot of times people ask for advice when God's already told them what to do because they're looking for somebody to tell them what they want to hear. Am I making sense to you? I know, I know, I could give you, I could give you names and dates and I'm not even talking about one individual. I know, of, I know of individuals who literally called through a whole list of Bible-believing preachers, King James guys, a whole list of Bible-believing preachers, and all the preachers told the individual the same thing about the situation and circumstance, and every one of them was a loser and a jerk and an idiot who doesn't know what he's talking about, and then they finally find guy number five or six who agrees with them, and he's the greatest. Now, five Bible-believing preachers have been doing it for 30 or 40 years, all told me the same thing, and I still didn't like what I was hearing. You see, when God actually speaks to you and you know God spoke to you, what are you asking anybody for? People come into my office, well, this is what the Lord, you know, I just, I just know what the Lord told me to do. Then why are you talking to me? What do you want me to say? I had somebody come into my office over a decade ago. Well, the Lord spoke to our hearts, and we just we want to know what you think. Okay? The Lord told us in your message that we're to leave your church. Okay? That's all? Okay? What do you want me to do? Correct God? You said God told you. If God told you, okay. That's better for you. It's better for us. And you've been a pain anyways, and you're not getting it right. So fine. Goodbye. What do you want me to do? We left the church, and the preacher never called us. Does anybody see a problem with this? Is it just me? Am I being so defensive of myself? Or does anybody see it? You left. Yeah. But then you're mad because the preacher didn't chase you. Hey, when God tells you to do something, do it. He said immediately I prefer not with flesh and blood. I know exactly what God said to me. And when God told me, I have to do what God said. All right, verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and turned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But, the other, but other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Now here's what I find very interesting about that. The Roman Catholic Church teaches the perpetual virginity of Mary. Anybody catching on? <laughs> so Jesus wasn't the only divine because the Bible says he had a brother. Something's wrong with that doctrine because Jesus was the only one that was conceived of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. None others were begotten of the Father. Mary wasn't a perpetual virgin. A little bit of Bible clears up a lot of false doctrine. A lot of religion can be cleared right up by the Bible. But they don't, want it. they don't want them to open the Bible. You know why? They might find out that in the Bible, they don't have to give 10% in the New Testament. Oh, horror of horrors. Whatever shall we do? You really want New Testament preaching? You don't want New Testament doctrine on preaching, on giving. All right, look at the next verse. Now the things which I write unto you, unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. 
Watch this. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. He said, people couldn't even recognize me. They didn't even know me. I was unknown by face, but all of them had heard about me. You realize that when Paul first got saved, the churches didn't want anything to do with him. They were scared of him. They were rejecting him. They were criticizing him. He didn't go up to the apostles before him right away. But what he did do, which we'll see when we go through the book of Acts, is eventually, if you go look at Acts chapter 15, you find out that they all got together in conference and sat down and discussed all this stuff. And they compared Paul's gospel and what Paul was preaching and what the Lord had showed Paul with the Old Testament scriptures, with what they knew of the Lord and their walking with him throughout his ministry, with everything the Holy Spirit of God had been doing. And they sat down in conference and they discussed this stuff and hammered out the doctrine. So what's different about biblical Christianity is biblical Christianity bears with it all the way through. And when I say all the way through, I'm talking about, oh, excuse the, excuse the cheap phrase to make preachers sound super smart so that you feel like you got to bow to them and trust them and not God. But apologetics. It's a cheap phrase. You understand that, right? To make preachers sound super smart so people feel like, well, I just need the preacher to tell me anything because I can't read my Bible and find out for myself. But I mean, going all the way back to apologetics for Christianity... And running all the way up through, all the way into prophecy, reaching out into the Old Testament. The different thing about biblical Christianity that you won't find in any other religion is there's constant checks and balances. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God's reasonable. And when you study the Bible and you look at the Bible as it compares to science, the Bible as it compares to archaeology, the Bible as it compares to law, the Bible as it compares to everything, prophecy and all the rest of that, the more you study the Bible with an open mind and an honest heart and a prayerful spirit, the more you begin to understand and realize that that book is divine. It's the Word of God. It came down from heaven. It knows the future. It knew the past. It called the past out before the past happened. It's told you about the future before the future came. It reads your mind. It reads your heart. It reads your motives. It reads your life. Right. Amen. That's a divine book. Amen. So the difference is you don't have just one guy like Muhammad who had some angel appear to him and everybody has to trust this guy's vision. You don't have one guy like Joseph Smith who an angel appears to him and, and everybody has to trust his vision. Oh, and then to confirm it, individually, that angel appears to different elders in that same sect, in that same cult. And we're taking one individual's word who's drunk the Kool-Aid and following the leader, but never, I mean, Jesus Christ showed up to about 500 at one time. After the Roman government said, lock it down because they're going to come lie about him. And the Jews are saying, make sure, make sure, make sure this thing doesn't spread. And a tiny little ragtag group of nobodies that didn't have anything to their name and were just absolutely broke, poor, rejected, off-scouring, scourge of the earth and were thrown away, wound up being right. And the thing spread like wildfire, crosses, uh, 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 checks and balances, and cross-examination and everything else. I'm telling you, the Bible stands to reason, and it's the perfect, inerrant, infallible, inspired words of Almighty God. And Paul even had the checks and balances. And he eventually met with the, the apostles, and they hammered stuff out. And so what you got in front of you is a pretty amazing book. Now, here's what I'd like to say, two things quickly in closing. From the get-go, from Jump Street, Paul got rejected, mocked, made fun of, criticized, scorned, disliked. Because of what he was before he got saved and what he did before he got saved. People throwing it up in his face. You fast forward all the way over there into the Corinthians, after he goes in and he sacrificed, he literally sacrificed in his body sacrifice and food, sacrifice and sleep. There's no way a man fasted as much as Paul did, both voluntarily and involuntarily, and weighed more than 125 pounds. My guess is, if they're right and he was five foot or less, he probably was about 115, maybe 120 at the most. I don't know. Did I tell you I don't know? I'm not creating a cult that's, you know, Paul's weight and height. I'm just telling you, I, I imagine this stuff. 
I really do. I think about it. It's weird, but I do. I think about it. A guy like that, rejected, mocked, scorned, go in and give his self for that church and establish that church and then have that church wind up criticizing him and false teachers come in and mock him and cut him off and criticize him and people start following false teachers and the man proved himself. And you know what he kept doing? He kept preaching the gospel. He kept teaching the saints. He kept feeding the sheep. He kept praying. He kept loving the Lord. He kept ministering. He kept working for God. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He didn't stop. He didn't let discouragement, depression, criticism, anything else, the brethren, hurt feelings, or childishness. Childishness that gets some people out of church nowadays. He didn't let any of that get to him. Because he kept the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing was, hey, God's given me a privilege to serve him. I don't deserve to be doing what I'm doing. And God's wanting to reveal Jesus Christ in me. And I want to make sure that my life is to the honor and the glory and the worship and the praise and the emulation and the copying of everything the Lord Jesus Christ himself is. That's what I want to be. Now look at verse 24. They glorified God in me. You know what I want? I'm, I'm sure of it at this point. I'm sure of it. You know what I want with my life? I want people to glorify God in me. I really don't care who likes me, who doesn't like me. I really don't care about being popular. I really don't care. I don't care. I just, none of that matters. I mean, I'm not trying to like, I mean, I know I could backslide tomorrow. I'll be walking in the flesh and care about all that stuff. But, but I'm telling you right now, I just don't care. There really is no point to being popular. There really is no point to being idolized. There really is no point to being the cool kid. There's just no point. You understand that, right? I'm going to be dead in a few years. You don't know. Spurgeon died at 58, so there's no promise that I'm going to live to be an old man. I don't have control over that. What if it glorifies God to cut me off early? He did less to roll off. You know what they said, too? They said that it was, a, it was a setup from the government or whatever, from the people that didn't like him. I don't know if it's true or not. What they did do is the plane that he should have been in, they grounded it. For whatever reason, he couldn't fly it because they put so much, I, I remember what it was, they put so much pressure on him with the legal system, he didn't have the money to fly in the plane that he should have been flying in because he had a bigger plane that he could have flown in. So the plane that he got in, he wound up having to go to, I think it was 19,000 feet or something like that to get over the storm. And the plane he was in wasn't, wasn't uh, big enough to sustain the winds up there and snapped off the wings. So there's the squeeze they were putting on him financially that made it impossible for him to fly on the right plane. And what he was doing was going to try to pick up some little girls that were addicted to drugs and on the streets and little boys that were alcoholics and drug addicts and pick them up and bring them back to the homes and get them in the homes to get them clean and off the dope and off the liquor. Great man of God. Used mightily of God. Cut off early. Makes absolutely no sense. And yet the crazy guy with the weird eyes, with the jets. You guys know what I'm talking about? What's his name? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, we still have him. But a guy like Lester Roloff can't even afford to fly on the right plane. So to get over the storm to try to keep everybody alive, the wings get sheared off from the winds. That don't make sense, does it? Hey, you know what? If it glorifies God, ain't that what it's about? <laughs> I know that's not a very positive message to leave you on. Let me give you something positive and we'll get out of here. Go to Romans chapter 8. I'm done here. Romans chapter 8. I thought this was a great verse to end Galatians chapter 1 with. Now, some, of you, some of you beat yourself up too much about your past. And, and some of you beat yourself up even more because your past has come back to haunt you after you got saved and you've made some mistakes post-salvation that you shouldn't have made. Right? And so you beat yourself up pretty bad and the devil gets advantage of you. Here's a great verse to end on. And we know. We don't doubt. We don't think. We don't cross our fingers in hope in that sense. And we know 
that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, you might be thinking, preacher, how does that have anything to do with Galatians chapter 1? It has everything to do with it. God took the most wicked man on the planet and said, since you love me now and you hear my calling now and you're responding to my calling now and you're doing what I've asked you to do, I'm going to take your past and I'm going to use your past for my glory in such a way that without your past, you'd have never been who you are. Only God can do that. It's literally a miracle. So just so you know, you don't get to go sow your wild oats and then say, then I'll get right and God will use it to glorify himself. That ain't how it works. That man was ignorant and unbelief and was the chief of sinners according to the perfect, inerrant, infallible word of God. So you don't get to take that from him. Because God said it. And God said, I'm going to take you, a chosen vessel, and I'm going to use you to glorify my son. Now, if God can do that with Paul, I guarantee you he can do it with you. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you so much for giving us...